Well, hello. Here we are back again talking about coaching. My name is Yannick. I'm here with Nikki. Hey, Nikki. Hey, how are you doing? We're missing Sivash today. Uh, he was uh, otherwise engaged and had to take care of something. So uh, it's the two of us for your listening and viewing pleasure, depending on uh, where you consume this. Um, we have an interesting question uh, today, which is, uh, my client is looking up to me as an expert. How do I manage the power dynamics? And I already love the way that the question is framed. I, we didn't make a note on who asked us that. So, and it's it's quite a, an entry from quite far back. Um, but I think the the question is an important one, right? Because we want to set up our coaching, uh, our coaching generally at eye level. Or do we? Or do you? I, I know mm. I do because I'm so inclined. I want to be at eye level. I want to be an equal. I want to be a, in partnership where I I'm usually not the expert. Sometimes I'm being put in that expert level. That's why I probably resonate with the question a lot, especially when I'm I'm working with newly qualified coaches and I've been doing it for a while. Uh, chances are they're still the expert at their way of coaching. But if somebody's just starting out and somebody else has done it for a while, there arguably is uh, that kind of expert uh, role in some way. So the question is to what extent are we willing to either be put in that situation or own that? Might there be value in it? How do we create a dynamic um, that is doesn't have to be equal, but I like it to be equal because that puts my client into a position where they make the decisions and they own their process and they take responsibility, which is something that is much more difficult when you're being put into the expert role. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to pause there to see if you have any kind of initial thoughts around this. Otherwise, I'll I'll just like... You started me off, I might keep going. Adlib. I love that question. I think it's really great. Um, you know, my thoughts take me right back to kind of my training. And I think really why coaching as a career appealed to me so much to begin with. And that's that kind of the variety and diversity of people and the different kind of topics and the different facets of being a human that you get to explore with people and I think you know the way I remember being, being taught is it's, it's it comes from the fact that in a way coaching is a non-expertise driven kind of um line of work in the sense of you don't need to be an expert on the topic that your client brings to you and I think the distribution of kind of expertise that I really liked the way it was put was kind of you know the client is an expert at their own life and you are there to kind of you're an expert at kind of facilitating conversation, helping them delve deeper. So you're kind of, you know, as a coach, you contribute in your own ways. And I think in that sense, you, you have expertise, um, mm -hmm. but you know, really it's, it's the client. Yeah. It's, it's like the collaborative process and the client really knows best because every, every person is unique um, mm -hmm. in the process, but there was something else that kind of was buzzing around my mind. On the other hand, you know, one, one sense in which you know you could maybe argue that clients um that uh, coaches have expertise is you know i don't know what you like to read but i imagine you know and i know your library very well i've, co I've <laughs> studied it copiously but, you know i read a lot of books around the subject that i don't necessarily expect or imagine clients would read and you know i do kind of accumulate i think a wide range of very relevant and helpful knowledge on subjects that clients tend to bring to coaching be it about time management or procrastination or perfectionism or whatever it is you know so, so so there is kind of there's relevant stuff you can bring in but I would never therefore claim to be an expert and I, I certainly wouldn't you know claim to be an expert at solving my clients issues for them as opposed to them mm. kind of you know yeah. I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and that, that triggers some, like, I mean, we could get into semantics of what does it mean to be an expert. And I I have worked through that with quite a lot of, uh, not just coaches, but like people in general. Uh, I, if you've really dove into a subject, if you've done something intensely for a year, you probably know more about that subject than what, 80, 90% of the population. Mm -hmm. You know, if you really immersed yourself in something, would you then call yourself an expert? And I, I mm -hmm. learned that the threshold for that is vastly different depending on who you ask. So when the question is, I'm being seen as an expert, for some people that sits very uncomfortably because they're like, oh, but I don't really know that much about it compared to this other person that I know. 
um, but compared to this person in front of you who just put you into the position of an expert, they see you as such. Mm -hmm. So there, there's an element to this question that is, uh, how do I deal with being put into that situation? Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of coaching, what's important is that we have that conversation, that we that we acknowledge the dynamics that seem to have emerged here. Mm -hmm. And for the coach to ask themselves the question, how does that sit with me? Is that is that adding or taking away from the value I bring to the work? Because mm -hmm. they might be quite happy in the expert role. In the expert role, let's say that they say expert meaning I have more information on this. And I'm happy to put the information on the table, but you're the expert on your life. You have access to all the information about you and how this information might resonate with you and how it might work for you. Mm -hmm. So I, I can say I have some information, but you're the expert on how to implement them or which ones to implement. Mm -hmm. So that's the question that the coach needs to ask themselves. And what the coach need to ask the client, I think in those situations, uh, it's helpful to acknowledge that. It's like, I regardless of what kind of words you put on it i um i've i've noticed the dynamic of like you putting me in an expert position or i've noticed you asking me for a lot of guidance or advice mm -hmm. or i've noticed you asking me for a lot of information in recent sessions or in this session um you know it's depending on how what you agreed on in the beginning of what this is and how it works you might express some discomfort with that or some concern, mm. you know, you might use it as a as a, a possibility or as an opportunity to strengthen the contract or revisit the contract. Maybe you would be okay to share more information, but you do want to acknowledge it. And perhaps we need to change something here about the contract. If you presented coaching as, look, I'm, I'm not going to give you advice. I'm not the expert. Um, and I'm going to create a space for you to think um, you know, I feel I, that you have the answers and that's what I want to expand and draw on. And mm -hmm. if you then notice a dynamic where the client is drawing on you to create the answers for them because you're seen as the expert or, you know, they kind of put you in that position, then it's it's a conversation that is very important because it, it changes the contract. Mm. I mean, I think, yeah, as in so many of our episodes, it kind of touches back on that point of kind of, yeah, setting expectations or clarifying ex expectations um i mean but the one thing that it made me think about here and you just speak there was what about you know when we as coaches kind of identify with a certain niche as opposed to kind of calling ourselves a coach more broadly more broadly doesn't that kind of you know i kind of understand why clients might expect to come to someone mm -hmm. who therefore has some ex expertise and like how yeah how to how to, to work with that really that. Yeah, of course and that's the danger when we create a niche for ourselves mm -hmm. you know because it's kind of implied or perhaps mm -hmm. very consciously communicated that i'm specializing in this or i'm an expert on this in some way and then it's much easier for the client to uh, put you into that position because maybe you've put yourself into that position consciously or unconsciously Mm. And it does something to the dynamic and people who have created a niche and market in that way will probably notice that the clients who come to see them, they will want to draw answers from them because they feel, you know, you know, mm. you know how to work with these kind of people or with this kind of issue or with this kind of pain, with this kind of goal. Mm. And you have seen it. And that's why they chose you because you're specializing mm. in this and the others, are, they don't. Mm -hmm. It's enter it almost kind of blurs that line a bit more between mentoring and strict coaching as well. And I, you know, I definitely right. feel like in the material that I kind of come across, there does seem to be a bit more, you know, a divide between people who are just completely open and non-expertise driven. And then people who, yeah, kind of maybe through a niche have kind of drawn on certain recurrences and similarities and come up with a bit more kind of a systematic way of working. I guess the difference is a bit more like how how much do you kind of really be present, focus in on and embrace the individual in, in their complete mm. uniqueness versus where where can you? And I think that is a reality, though, generalize about certain things and that seem useful and are recurrent enough that it seems appropriate right. to to yeah, generalize. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If if you've developed a system 
or if you developed a model for something and you advertise your coaching services through that, mm -hmm. then it already communicates that you've done that based on your expertise. Mm -hmm. So I think to, to address the question quite directly, how do I manage the, the power dynamics, not just by acknowledging them as they show up, but also by reflecting on how do you set up the power dynamics mm. with the way that you're marketing, with what your message is. And if anybody works with a copywriter or uh, somebody who's creating marketing materials for them, I, I, I had a real aversion to that because I've uh, tried it with a few people and they put stuff out that they know works in terms of getting people in, mm -hmm. but it sets up the dynamic in a way. It's something that they don't understand and that, you know, I don't blame them, but like it sets the dynamic up in a way that I'm being put into this role that is not conducive to my way of coaching mm. because I want my client to be the expert. And if it's about procrastination, for example, I want them to learn as much about procrastination as possible rather than me teaching them procrastination uh, counter techniques or educating them about that. Mm. You know? But that's my style of coaching. I totally appreciate every coach who has an expertise and who has an area where they create differences and where they have learned that certain interventions or questions or structures or interventional processes, uh, they work most likely. You know? They have a tendency to work for most people most of the time. Some mm -hmm. people have just you know, cracked the code for certain things. I'm an existential coach, so there is no code cracking. It's like very individual, very subjective, and there are rarely answers to the big questions. But when it comes to, for example, mindfulness-based stress reduction, there's a program for that and it's structured and, you know, there's good research on it working. Um, other areas, maybe there's similar things. So I wouldn't dismiss somebody who's developed expertise and created a coaching program on that basis but it's not the kind of coaching I usually do. Yeah. You know, there's a blueprint for business. Uh, there's millions of them. You know, if you ask Sivash, there's a certain way that you uh, create coaching clients, which is very much based on the Chandlerian, Rich Litwin, Prosperous coaching school approach. You know, you like without getting too much into it, but there's a particular blueprint yeah. uh, that is still open to be very individual but there's a way that we would say, this is how you get more coaching clients. Mm. And I, I have met quite a few coaches who say, well, for me, that's just, that's not really how it works. And they dig their head into, for example, advertising and figure out how Google AdWords works and they pick a niche and, you know, they don't go the conversation creating route and that works for them. So even there, you can come from a position of expertise, but do your client a disservice by imposing your expertise on them when actually mm -hmm. something different might work for them. Mm -hmm. So different ways and different times to manage the, the power mm -hmm. dynamics in this way. Yeah, nice. You know, as, as always, and, you know, I think as kind of the, the field of coaching expands and broadens, you know, I think like it falls on a continuum or there's always a spectrum. I think, you know, it's exactly as you said, you individually as the coach and then whoever you work with kind of, yeah, have to just... Um, be on the same page about how you like to work and what it is you each want to bring or get from each other. Yeah. Sounds good. And it, and it can be awkward to acknowledge sure. power dynamics because mm. it's flattering to the ego when somebody puts you into the position of expert. And I think this is where we might have to work hard to actually um, like counter that or point it out. How do we have that conversation? What kind of, how can we find the words so that it's, it's not an awkward thing mm. to mention, you know? but particularly to figure out how do I like the power dynamics to be? And it can be easy to like it when you're seen as the expert, mm -hmm. but what you're taking on is a, is a amount of responsibility. Mm -hmm. you know? And the more you're being put into the expert position or the more you own and create the expert position for yourself, the easier you might find it to sell and the harder you might find it to work. Mm -hmm because you're sitting with all of this responsibility that now you're the expert and you're supposed to deliver. Mm. And I've seen a lot of coaches uh, really be weighed on quite heavy by that responsibility because they're consciously or unconsciously had been put or had uh, put themselves into this expert role. And mm. then it was difficult to be present with their clients because they felt it was up to them to deliver the results. Yeah, I can totally imagine and hear that and have, you know, put myself in that position before, for sure. Just kind of thinking, you know, another good way to think about it probably is just to turn it around. And I think, you know, 
I have at times deliberately sought out a coaching structure that has that kind of more blueprint because there was a kind of a certain comfort and confidence in knowing, you know, this is something that's worked and that's what I'd like to get in. You know, I really appreciate that kind of structured, systematic way of working through it at certain times, right? It depends on what state I'm in and what I'm needing at that moment. On the other mm -hmm. hand, at some times, I find that is a bit too kind of, you know, a bit too formulaic. And I'm like, well, yeah. you know, there's so much there that kind of doesn't sit right with me. And I really want a very, I want someone to really understand me and my individual quirks and like incompetencies or dreams <laughs> or whatever. And, you know, at, at those times, having an approach that's completely open and like catering to me as an individual has felt really yeah. good. So, you know, oh, um, I'm so happy you say that because yeah. I think it's so important. I almost was like, okay, what else is there? But like, I think this is so important because it's, um, it's more, it's in a way more comfortable. It's, it creates some certainty to be in the expert position, to know, to have the blueprint, to have the structure, to have the 10 step process that is mm. going to help somebody to use the model that some, you know, hotshot therapist or coach sold you as the surefire way to deal with procrastination. Mm. There, there's certainty in that. And through that certainty comes comfort. And I think when we are starting out as a coach, but I think at any level, it creates, uh, it, it's really, it's tempting, it's attractive to have that because it kind of holds us and it, it mm -hmm. you know, it tackles the kind of anxiety of, mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen in this session. I don't know if this client is going to get what they want. I don't even know what I'm going to say next. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I am in this process. And I think it takes a level of courage to to enter this space of creative dialogue, mm -hmm. you know, to create to to enter a space where you don't know what's going to happen, and you don't know uh, what the process is. Um, mm -hmm. We can have a rough outline of like, well, we're going to talk about where you're going and where you're now, and then how we bridge that gap. And there are certain coaching processes uh, that we can that can hold and manage this conversation. But within that, if we don't create the space where we're just tuning in and we're entering this creative dialogue where things happen and we might not know exactly how this is going to play out, I think some of the biggest changes and most magical transformations come out of that space. And if you were to be the expert who applies a certain process because you know how these things work, sometimes you really take something away and sometimes you really add something. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's another one of like, there's not necessarily a better or worse, mm. but it needs to be contracted with a client and see what they want and what you feel is going to most help them in this scenario. Yeah, I really hear that. You know, as you were saying, I was kind of thinking for myself about both experiences that I had again. It's just, you know, I, I really feel each one had their pros and cons and, and benefits and drawbacks. Um, I feel like it's a bit kind of, if you were maybe shorter on time and you're very specific and you know what you want, you go to maybe, or I would have a tendency of going more to the formula. If you have more space and you're more explorative and you know, you can afford to have as many sessions as you like, and you really trust the person that you're working with, then I think that the, 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 in, the more kind of open process can, can be therefore also potentially the more richer rewarding mm -hmm. one with those aha moments. Cause you're creating something new and really kind of unique between the two of you, yeah. more revelation, whilst the other one is kind of more like solution. I, I think they're both great depending on what yeah. you're needing. Um, yeah, and it's fine to switch back and forth, right? Um, or to have both, yeah. Because sure. sometimes we buy a book and we, or when we open the book, we don't want the book to say, so what do you think? <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we want the book to be written by an expert who knows yeah. a lot of stuff and gives us the information, mm. you know? And then we can ask ourselves the question, how does that gel and resonate with me? Which parts of this could I apply? Which parts of this would need to be changed? Which parts of this just wouldn't work for me because of my particular context? Mm. Um, but how wonderful if somebody sits in front of you who can put the expert head on and share some information without mm. claiming that they're the expert on your life and how to do it. You know, they can say, hey, this worked for most people, most uh, like for a lot of people, a lot of the time, you know, when somebody comes to me and they say, well, I'm struggling with focus, I get distracted very easily. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd be super curious about whether they've cultivated a meditation habit. Uh, and where because I know that if you do, like, if you cr um, practice your meditation skills, 
uh, if you if you get into a habit of meditating regularly, you're going to be more in charge of where your attention goes. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, and this is from my expertise in positive psychology and looking into the research and having meditated myself and having, you know, worked with a lot of other people who develop meditation habits or worked with that for years. Mm -hmm. So I know that from with my expert position, but I'm not going to put myself into the expert position of saying, this is the thing that's going to work for you. And here's how you need to do it. You know, I might say, here's how it could be done. I quite like this way. This kind of thing worked for me. This worked with, for a client who seems quite similar to what the situation that you're in. Uh, what do you think? You know, because I still believe you're the expert, even though I had some expertise right now, which I put on the table. But mm -hmm. I still maintain my fundamental position of you're the expert on your life and career and you make all the decisions. Mm -hmm. Cool. Nice. Yeah. I mean, a final thought that just made me think of as well was kind of I think it kind of there's this fundamental duality where I feel like I've been coming across it a lot lately or just thinking about it a lot but this conversation is reminding me of that it's just kind of there's almost like a an inner ten like attention in in being a human in 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 this own way kind of you know we are all a lot more alike than we maybe like to think or want to admit and yet we are all still completely unique and individual and you know I think there is this possibility of generalizing about things that help us general solutions to, to problems that are relate, relatable and common for all of us. And that's that kind of, you know, the thing that we all share and that's why it can work. And on the other hand, though, I think, you know, whilst we may, may all fundamentally work in very similar ways or are structured in the same way as humans, emotionally or whatever, in whatever way that is, that allows for these commonalities, we're also implement everything and have a completely unique kind of life trajectory and in in engage with and integrate those things individually so you know again it's like this tension between you know universality and individualism you know you mm. just gotta gotta pick what's right for you and what's gonna help you most at any any one time oh i love some good philosophical thoughts towards the end <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in. yeah it feels like we need a glass of red wine and then we're oh, back God. at our previous not, question not the next hangover yeah <laughs> I, Nikki, I know this is really tea. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki, thank you so much. I, I think I think we can leave it here. Don't you think? Awesome. Okay. I, well, I hope you guys got some uh, got some interesting thoughts out of that. As always, we'd love to hear where you stand on this. Have you experienced being put into that position? Maybe you've reflected on how you might create that. Um, and just there's so many different ways of coaching and so many different philosophies and schools of thought. Uh, so I. Yeah, we're always curious about having the conversation. So have the conversation with us, have the conversation with a colleague or with yourself. Uh, that's what we're here for, you know, talking about coaching. So thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. I appreciate your commitment to learning and growing as a coach. Just a few things before you go. First of all, we're doing this for you, so if there's anything you'd like us to talk about, do send us a question. Secondly, we're not doing this for profit, so we rely on your support to help us reach as many coaches as we can. So if you can send this episode to a friend or tell a fellow coach uh, about what we're doing here, maybe you can subscribe or leave us a review, or even support us on Patreon, um, that would be amazing. And lastly... You can find us across all major platforms, so uh, whether you like to watch or you like to listen or you like to download episodes and listen to it uh, in your car while you're driving through somewhere with no internet, uh, you can do so too. Um, and that's it from us. Thank you and I hope to see you next time.